And the word of the ad I liked it for the problem. record. I'm with Sorry, you. Go ahead. You, you liked it? It's good. Yeah. It good I, I mean, I I I felt it was entertaining. I mean, I did not yeah. expect an I did not expect an Oscar worthy movie, which apparently it did get nominated for Best Picture, which surprised me when I heard that. I mean, I wasn't expect I was expecting like fighter jets and explosions, and that's exactly what I got, and I was okay with it. <laughs> All right, welcome to episode 74 of Farm to Markets. Today we are talking about the Silicon Valley bank run, March Madness, Mayor Shenanigans, a new miracle weight loss drug, and the Oscars. The first thing we got to point out here today is that we got uh, Zach Falk with us from Black Diamond Mortgage. Welcome, Zach. He's, uh, Thanks for having me, Tom. You absolutely. Yeah, Zach is graciously uh, filling in for us. Uh, for Drew is, or excuse me, Joe is currently in Israel right now. And uh, Drew was supposed to be here, but he uh, had uh, some some acute uh, stomach bug that is uh, preventing him from being on the show today. So, so he's having a good time right now. But Zach, uh, thanks uh, thanks for joining us. Absolutely. Okay. All right. So for the first question today is that I'm sure a lot of people watched this uh, over the weekend, but uh, Silicon Valley Bank uh, collapsed on Friday in the second biggest bank failure in U.S. history after a run on deposits doomed the tech-focused leader. Excuse me. Uh, doing the tech focus leaders' plans to raise fresh capital, uh, Silicon Bank has many startups and venture uh, capital firms as clients. Uh, during the pandemic, those clients basically were generating a ton of cash, and Silicon Valley Bank was receiving a lot of deposits. And at the time, uh, you know, interest rates, treasury bills were paying almost nothing. So what Silicon Valley Bank did is they basically put a lot of cash into these long-term uh, treasury bonds, trying to get the highest yield they possibly could. But uh, as the Federal Reserve started raising interest rates, um, it, you know, it, it caused those long-term bonds to basically be sold lost. Because if you have a long-term bond paying 1% and you can buy one for one paying 3%, nobody wants to buy your long-term bond that's paying uh, 1%. So if they ever needed the cash and had to sell those bonds, they had to sell them at a loss to get the cash uh, out of them. And that's exactly what happened. So what Silicon Valley Bank did is they had to start selling some of these bonds and they had to do some accounting measures to free up some capital. And that caused a lot of the venture capital firms to get a little nervous about the solvency of uh, Silicon Valley Bank. And they basically called up all their portfolio clients, so all the money that the venture capitalists had given money to. And they said, hey, you might wanna move your, uh, your, your cash that you use for payroll and all this stuff out of Silicon Valley Bank, and they called their friends, and their friends called their friends, and then basically you get a classic run on the bank. So I guess my question is, is that do you think there's a risk of contagion in to other major banks? And what, what do you think Silicon Valley Bank should have been bailed out by the uh, the FDIC? And I will start with Alex, and then we'll go to uh, Zach, and then uh, and then myself here. Well, as far as contagion risk goes, if we just if we believe what government officials and banking officials are telling us, the answer is probably not. Uh, the biggest financial institution that I could find that had exposure to Silicon Valley Bank as an investor that isn't going to get bailed out is, I think, SoftBank from Japan. Uh, beyond that, it, it doesn't seem like Silicon Valley Bank failing is going to cause a lot of other banks in the United States to fail. I mean, it could. But uh, it, it, for now, it doesn't seem like it is going to. Uh, the bigger risk is that something that ha the, the thing that happened with Silicon Valley Bank starts happening to other banks, uh, not necessarily because there is exposure risk to Silicon Valley Bank, but because depositors get spooked and decide, you know, regardless of what bank they, they bank with, they deposit with, they decide they want their money out, too. That, to me, is the is the much larger risk. Um, in 2020, I believe, uh, the uh, the reserve requirement was lowered to zero for every bank, and it's remained there. So, I, you know, you'd have to go bank by bank to see how much in cash reserves they actually have. But the requirement is zero, and with interest rates rock bottom for so long, they're probably operating with very little reserves. Uh, so the risk, to me, again, is more... Um, Will will other banks experience runs rather than are they exposed to losses from Silicon Bank's Valley Bank's failure? As far as should they have been bailed out, um, in general, I don't think it's a good idea to bail out banks because that's 
just encouraging more bad behavior. Um, but from a policymaker's standpoint, you know, if if you start seeing this kind of thing spread, you start to have to ask yourself, you know, it, which is worse, another few trillion dollars added to the national debt and increasing moral hazard or the failure of the financial system? We're not there yet, so I guess we'll have to see. Yeah, I think I agree with a lot of what you're saying, Alex. I think we did see, of course, that over the weekend, Signature Bank followed suit uh, right behind SVB. And so if you're looking at the possibility of contagion, some might say, well, there was two, not just one. So how does that impact the way that we view this? However, I agree. I don't believe that we are in a position where contagion is is a concern for the general citizen. I think... Um, the data makes sense that it that somebody tried something and it and it didn't work and that's part of if you believe in capitalism uh which i do then having a bank fail is okay it's part of taking risk and trying to figure out how to make money in today's economy so do i believe they should be bailed out no i don't and i think that um part of the reason is is where does the money come from to bail out these uh, these banks. Well, truthfully, it generally comes from the taxpaying American, which we are those and probably you who are watching this are those. And so therefore, I think it's acceptable for, for banks to have some challenges to deal with. And it's okay. And another bank will come to the table and take their place. Okay, Zach, I, I, I owe you three seconds because I had a little, I was a little uh, fast <laughs> on my uh, trigger finger here. So I'm gonna have to give that to you at some point. But um, you know, I, I get what they were doing is that in a time of low interest rates, they wanted to get the maximum yield. So they went ahead and bought long term bonds while times were good. But they made the classic mistake of thinking that, you know what? Yeah, we're just we're just flush with cash right now. We need somewhere to put it. And, you know, we, we don't see the good times ending. And then they do. And then and then all of a sudden, you know, people start needing cash, things you didn't anticipate start happening. And now you got to make hard choices of what you sell. It's kind of on the risk management department of why they actually did this. And there's some banks that were paying lower yields, but I think you can thank their risk management because they're like, you know what, we're, we're not going to buy long term bonds because the Federal Reserve is in no uncertain terms told us that they're going to start raising interest rates soon and we don't want to be caught in long term bonds. And that's and so a lot of banks that are paying less, while it's not obviously you don't want your, you know, you, you want your money making the most as possible, but you also want your money safe. And I think, uh, you know, I don't know what uh, Silicon Valley Bank, if they were just overconfident that uh, that they weren't going to start seeing the deposits decline or what happened or what the decisions were made in the risk management department. But, um, you know, they, they made bad decisions. As far as the FDIC insurance, I mean, we've already agreed as a nation that banks are backed by FDIC insurance. The thing I have a problem with is that we basically just said, hey, you know what? You know, this is a big bank. We don't want all these people losing their jobs and, and losing a bunch of money on it. So we're just going to, instead of just up to the, the $250,000 of FDIC insurance, you know, per person, we're just going to give you the whole thing back. And in my mind, that creates a lot of moral hazard. And while in the, in the short term, you know, it makes more sense to bail the bank out because we don't have to deal with the, uh, with the pain and the anguish right now. You know, it, it's a slippery slope because where does it stop? Is that we're just going to backstop everything with uh, with FDIC insurance, which the FDIC insurance corporation basically gets their, you know, they, uh, banks that are part of the corporation have to pay the FDIC insurance corporation fees. And those fees go to backstop any failed banks. And so technically, they're not technically drawing on taxpayer money. But if, if we keep uh, getting a habit of where we're just going to uh, protect above and beyond what FDIC insurance is, at some point, banks are going to start raising their fees and you and me are going to start paying for for their decisions, which I'm not sure that I really want to start doing because it creates this moral hazard where if, if banks are like, you know what, FDIC is just going to insure 100 percent of our deposits. We're going to go ahead and now take some risks. And if, mm -hmm. if everybody keeps doing that, you're going to look at a, a major uh, uh, banking failure, which I, I am I am not a fan of. So, I'm, you know, use the moment of time. So I'll stop talking here and uh, we'll, uh, we'll move on to the uh, to the next question. So, um, uh, okay, so, so uh, moving away from finances, in 2023, NCAA March Madness brackets were released uh, this last weekend. Employers lose nearly $14 billion, billion with a B, in productivity during the tournament when people watch games 
uh, fill up practice and talk about games during work hours. Okay? So, however, watching some college hoops uh, as a team will likely have a positive effect on many offices. Four in five employees or 78% say watching uh, and celebrating March Madness uh, at work boosts morale. So the question here is, um, should employees ban March Madness games in their office uh, or encourage it or come up with something else? Alex, uh, what, do you, what do you think? I'm going to go with uh, find a way to guide it into a way that doesn't disrupt work too much while still generally allowing it to happen. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a morale booster. People like it. Uh, people participate in it who don't generally even watch college basketball. Um, it's kind of like the Super Bowl and then it's an unofficial holiday. Um, I, you know, I, I would say, you know, maybe increase the number of breaks, put it, put the games on in the break room, have an office pool for, uh, you know, maybe not necessarily gambling, but like, you know, perks around the office kind of a thing. Uh, I would say embrace it rather than fight against it. Cause if you fight against it, you might just end up making your employees unhappy and, uh, that's not good for productivity either. So I would probably go with embrace it. I completely agree. My, uh, my personal opinion is just let it go. And the particular reason is, is as an employer, in theory, you would have chosen employees who do a good job of self-regulating certain things during office hours anyway. And if that's the case, then why would you choose to increase uh, rules and regulations around one topic when maybe you don't around uh, checking in on your social media? If, if you're in a marketing type position, there's a lot of blurred possible lines there. Are you checking your own personal stuff or are you doing company work? And so the point is, is if you have employees who are able to self-regulate, embrace it. The problem too is if you don't and it creates a problem, well, turnover is also very expensive. In fact, many would say it's more expensive than uh, doing some sort of employee retention opportunities through perks, right? And so I think as a business, embracing it is actually in the long-term best interest from a financial perspective for an employer. Yeah, that is an interesting way to look at it. And I think it does boil down to the employees that you hire because, you know, good employees will make sure work and tasks are completed. And, you know, if they want to check in on the game, great. At our office in particular, it's not a huge problem because nobody, at least in the office here, watches basketball. I don't know about uh, Alex. I don't know how big of a basketball fan Alex is. But, you know, during during work hours, I'm like, you know, I'm, you know, I, I'm, I'm not a huge enough fan where I'm going to watch it during work hours. That said, I am, you know, this weekend, I am having my uh, my four-year-old pick brackets and my wife and my daughter are going to pick their brackets and then uh, I'll scold my four-year-old if he uh, if he makes bad decisions. So that's, uh, that's what's going on this weekend. Uh, all right, let's see here. So, so there's a, uh, so there's a mayor in uh, uh, somewhere in Alabama. Um, I'll see if I can find the name here in a minute, but his name's Mayor Richard Phillips. And he went viral for a series of TikTok videos. Uh, um, okay, so Mayor Richard Phillips is known as Mayor Shenanigans. Okay, so he made a bunch of TikTok videos where uh, where people uh, uh, basically, you know, he requests him to do things, and he does, uh, you know, unguarded responses to staff, and basically just just has like a, a social media presence. Presence, and one of the things that's unique about Mayor Shenanigans is that if you if you contact his office at his uh, Alabama town, he will actually come out and like take a selfie with you. And this has drawn a lot of attention from tourists because people, while they may not go to his uh, his town in Alabama, they might stop in his town just to get a pair, just to get a, a selfie with Mayor Shenanigans. And, uh, and apparently he now has 117,000 followers on TikTok and uh, and Mayor Richard Phillips or Mayor Shenanigans credits these videos for putting his town on the map. Do you think this is uh, do you think this is unprofessional for him, or do you think this is uh, this is marketing genius? What do you think? Well, if there's if the, if it's unprofessional at all, which I don't really think it is, um, I would say it's mostly marketing genius. Um, I grew up in a smaller town in Texas that at the time was still kind of a smaller town it's now been absorbed by houston but um 
most of these small towns, you know, been to a lot of them. There's not a whole lot about them that's different. You know, they all have their little historic downtown areas, you know, boutique shops, you know, little restaurants or bars, that kind of thing. They're all pretty much the same. Everybody's kind of a homer for their hometown, but for the most part, they're not that different. Uh, so to find an interesting way like this to uh, draw people out of Birmingham because they're like 45 minutes away, uh, to come spend time in one of many small towns that are around Birmingham that otherwise aren't all that different from one another. Uh, I think it's a pretty cool thing. You know, if it if it brings people in, if it helps the local population, helps local businesses, that kind of stuff, I think it's great. I think there's a balance between shenanigans and our duties, right? So um, as a general rule of thumb, I would side with you, Alex, that this is marketing genius. And this is a great question for me because uh, as a loan originator for a mortgage company, I'm a salesperson. And so I use social media to market myself to the people in our community. And, and one of the ways in which I do that is through some goofy content every once in a while. Um, so where this where this matters is I think the balance is important, though. So if it's all goofy, then that becomes your reputation. If it's all business, then that becomes your reputation. I think what people like, if you look at just human nature, I think people like a balance. They like to have some personality, some fun, some humor. But then I do think it's important to provide content, particularly in the office of a mayor, that is valuable for the citizens of his town. And so I think that there it's appropriate to find balance. However, being goofy is fun. People enjoy it. And that's just part of, of being a person. So uh, the other interesting thing I was going to mention real quick is that Montana has a bill right now that's going on called SB 419 for whether TikTok should be banned in the state of Montana and actually just passed the Senate in the, the Montana Senate, which is crazy. So I'll leave this out there as just a, something to consider. Should he be using TikTok? <laughs> yeah, uh, man, I owe you like seven seconds now yeah no I, yeah great question i don't know if you should i mean if you're a mayor of a town like a small town that doesn't see a lot of people why not market it i mean obviously you don't want to go overboard and you know do you know you don't want to go overboard with it but i mean if it draws attention to your town and people are coming to your town uh to see the mayor and they're putting your town on the map i, I don't see any problem with it you just want to make sure you find a successor that's going to be uh you know as uh as you know adept at it as you are because if you go away then you know the town might uh might go under but uh interesting about the uh, the tiktok thing i did not know about that mm -hmm. all right okay uh let's see here all right so we got a couple more questions so one so the next one here is that the national institute for health and care excellence or nice as they're called uh, concluded that there's a drug, which I feel like I'd have to cut out my tongue to say the name of it. So I'll just, maybe I'll just put it in the link, uh, in the video here. Um, it's like WeGovy, I think is how they say it, W-E-G-O-V-Y. Um, so it's marketed as being safe, effective, and affordable. So based on the evidence from the clinical trials, NICE uh, says that this drug could help people reduce their weight by over 10% if implemented alongside nutrition and lifestyle changes. Famous personalities such as Elon Musk have used it and say that it worked well for them. And I guess in in uh, in Hollywood, people are getting uh, are are liking because it, it helps them lose weight for you know I don't know on videos or something like that. They didn't really say what they're losing weight for, but I guess people in Hollywood love it. Uh, what, what do you think? Do you think? Um, uh, and I think the uh, the National Healthcare Service in uh, in England is going to start prescribing this drug. What do you, what do you think about stuff like this? Are these uh, uh, is, is this good for, for, for weight loss or would you, you know, what are your thoughts on this, uh, on this drug? So, I mean, I don't have any issue with the drug itself. The problem is, uh, as the national obesity and overweight rates show, people are already not dieting and exercising. And the pill seems to only really work if you are dieting and exercising. So if you're not going to diet and exercise, taking the pill probably doesn't do any good. Um, so, you know, it's it's easy when you're a millionaire with a personal trainer to uh, juice your results. But if you're an average person that's already not dieting and exercising, I don't think this is going to do a whole lot for anybody. Spot on. This is not the cure for obesity. 
you know what the cure for obesity is? It's diet and exercise, right? That's exactly what you're saying. Uh, this reminds me of the movie that came out, uh, I don't know, it's probably 10, 15 years ago now, as crazy as that sounds, the Hunger Games series. Uh, there's, a, there's a particular scene in one of those movies where they're at some event and all the wealthy people take this pill and the pill is kind of crass, so bear with me here, but what the pill does is it actually causes them to throw up. And the purpose is so they can go eat more food. And so the reason that this was reminded me of this is that we're just trying to come up with ways to allow our current lifestyles to continue without consequence. So I'm not, I'm not a fan of this drug personally. Uh, I, I agree. As it, you know, I always find it funny is that the, all this thing, they always pair these, these supplements and drugs with is it helps with diet, you know, diet and exercise. Like, well, of course it does. Uh, for what I've read, though, is that it does suppress hunger. So, I mean, if you're like, you know, like in the, you know, it's things are bad for you and you need to get things under control and you take it and it works and there's not too many side effects. Okay. You want to take it on the prescription of a doctor, but I wouldn't get reliant on it. And yeah, diet and exercise um, is a good way to go about it. So, uh, all right. Okay. So I don't know, you know, <laughs> so we're talking about March Madness. So, but over the weekend, uh, it was the Oscars, which I didn't know about till like Friday, but I guess, or until Sunday when I guess it was on my phone, uh, Wall Street Journal told me that uh, I guess the Oscars were this weekend. So uh, over the weekend, uh, a movie called Everything, Everywhere, All at Once, apparently won the uh, the biggest award at the Oscars. Uh, have you seen it? And uh, do you think the film des des deserves the award? And if not, um, which, which film uh, deserves it? <clears throat> Uh, so I have not seen it. I've only seen two that were nominated for Best Picture, Top Gun and All Quiet on the Western Front. Uh, I thought All Quiet on the Western Front was really well done. Uh, of the two, I would have given it to that one over Top Gun, but I enjoyed both of them. Um, as far as World War I movies go, if you like those, 1917 I thought was better than All Quiet on the Western Front. I have not seen it, but I texted my wife and I say, we got to watch it. And she said, I already told you we have to watch it. And I didn't listen. So I'm looking forward to watching it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> watch it. Uh, uh, okay. Well, yeah, you're almost right on time, but no, uh, Top Gun was garbage. I'll tell you that as somebody who enjoyed the first <laughs> really? one, Top Gun was garbage. Wow. I didn't watch this one, watch the trailer, looked all right, but I watched the banking crisis this weekend. So I did not see uh, the Oscars. All right, so great. Everybody did it uh, fantastic on time. We didn't have anybody go over. Zach technically actually has probably like four or five seconds left. So I'm actually going to make you a winner, Zach, because I, uh, I didn't realize we were being close. But um, when, uh, when it's like a hairline finish like this, Zach is a winner. Again, you get no prizes, and uh, there are no awards. So sorry about that. Maybe but, I'll no, just Zach, we, uh, yeah. we, we appreciate you having on this week. And uh, that's it for uh, episode 74 of uh, Farming Markets. 